1996, El Menchor lived in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there he committed himself completely to crime. That was all he ever did. Drugs, robbery, assault, and intimidation. And he did it with a fearlessness that damned all consequences. The young man's main hustle was shuttling across the border under assumed names, facilitating the sale of meth. However, by 1986, his luck ran out, and he was arrested and charged with robbery and gun possession. El Mencho was soon released, but he continued where he left off, transporting drugs across the border. By 1989, he was once again arrested, but this time on drug charges. Then his illegal immigrant status came to the notice of the authorities, and this time he was deported. But El Mencho was unrelenting. While others would thank their lucky stars and lay low in Mexico, El Mencho went back to the trade, and a few months later, he was back in the US once again, moving drugs across the border. By September of 1992, El Mencho was arrested one last time, and this time he was handed federal charges. According to the court records, El Mencho and his brother Abraham were busted in a San Francisco bar named Imperial while trying to seal a heroin deal. Abraham was in charge of securing the deal, while El Mencho, who was just 26 years old at the time, was on the lookout. However, he kept an eye on his brother and somehow suspected that the people they were selling the drugs to were undercover policemen. Later, he shared his suspicions with his brother and suggested that they never do business with them. When Abraham asked his brother how he knew, El Mencho said he noticed that they handed them well-stacked notes and not wrinkled ones. It turned out El Mencho was correct, but unfortunately for them, the same police would arrest them three weeks after that incident. This arrest was a milestone in El Mencho's life because it led to his final deportation and his emergence in the scene of organized crime. Meanwhile, El Mencho found himself stuck between a rock and a hard place. El Mencho had a strong chance of beating the federal drug charges and winning the case, but at the same time, his brother Abraham had a record of felony drug sentences. So, if El Mencho pled not guilty, his brother had a high chance of getting thrown in the hole for life. So, in a rare display of loyalty and selflessness, El Mencho pled guilty to save his brother from a life sentence. He was sentenced to five years and was held in Big Spring Correctional Center in Texas. Rise to Terror after serving three years, El Mencho was released and deported in January of 1997. He was now 30 and a hardened felon. The years that followed saw El Mencho settling in a Jalisco town called Tomatlan, where he became an officer of the law with the state police. During this period, El Mencho engaged in intense training in security and counterintelligence. Now, it's unclear whether this was deliberate, because if it was, it was genius, and it was about to serve him well in the next stage of his life. El Mencho quit the force and made his way to Guadalajara, and it was there where he met and joined the Millennial Cartel. The Millennial had once been their own organization, but by the turn of the century, they were essentially a subsidiary of Sinaloa. And that's because they were under the leadership of Nacho Coronel, who just happened to be the Sinaloa Cartel's co-founder and the uncle of El Chapo's wife. Coronel was a brilliant and ruthless narcotics businessman, known more popularly as the King of Crystal for his dominance of the meth trade. He also ran the Guadalajara trafficking zone for Sinaloa. At first, El Mencho was recruited as a protection detail for Nacho's colleague, the drug Lord Armando Valencia Cornelio, alias El Maradona. Then, in a short period, El Mencho rose through the ranks quickly to become a top and well-respected lieutenant. El Mencho and his group also managed the Sinaloa cartel's drug operations, finances, and murder activities in the states of Colima and Jalisco. However, El Maradona was arrested by the Mexican military. Then, about nine months later, in December of 2009, Nacho was killed in a shootout with the Mexican military. Suddenly, there was a power vacuum in the Millennial Cartel's leadership, and someone had to fill it. El Mencho was convinced he was that person. Unfortunately, the Sinaloa higher-ups thought otherwise and installed a colleague. This infuriated El Mencho and everyone loyal to him. Betrayals, backstabbings, and assassinations became the order of the day, and with time, the consequences of the civil war spilled into the streets of Guadalajara, Jalisco. Finally, the cartel collapsed and split into two factions. One faction was known as La Resistencia, that remained loyal to the old order, and the other was Los Matazetas, headed by El Mencho. A war broke out between them, but El Mencho moved first, reigning holy hell on them, killing anyone remotely affiliated with his rivals until he finally won the war and consolidated his influence in western Mexico. The group would later change its name to the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, which when translated to Spanish reads as Cartel de Jalisco Nueva Generación, more popularly known as CJNG. CJNG versus Sinaloa. With El Mencho came a level of savagery that was unprecedented, even by narco standards. While El Chapo killed only when he felt it was necessary, El Mencho turned it into a sport. Not for his amusement, he did it for intimidation. There were mass killings, people kidnapped, 
tortured and thrown in the middle of busy streets. At one point, CJNG operatives assaulted and burnt a 10-year-old girl alive whom they mistook for a rival's daughter. Then, not long after, the CJNG assassins executed a man and his toddler son by detonating sticks of dynamite duct taped to their bodies, laughing as they filmed the ghastly scene with their phones. But all of this was intentional because it was El Mencho's language and he needed it to clear the way for the drug lord's expansionist agenda for Tijuana. At the time, Tijuana was Sinaloa cartel's territory. It was a drug trafficking corridor that served easy access to many of the major US western cities, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Chicago, and some others. At least a billion dollars worth of drugs ran through the city, and El Mencho wanted it all to himself. In 2013, he began creeping into the territory, employing his signature violence to either intimidate or eliminate Sinaloa distributors. This escalated into a war which was exactly what he wanted. And as he battled El Chapo for Tijuana, he also got into a peculiar war with the Mexican state, CJNG versus the Mexican military. El Mencho's war with the Mexican military started with the US. His rapid rise to the top, his penchant for violence, and his ultra-violent cartel had inspired the US government to hit him where it hurt. El Mencho had used Narcos money to set up several legitimate businesses around the world that were run by his family members. So the US targeted the businesses, arrested his family members, including his son, and began and freezing their accounts. By 2012, the Mexican army joined the party and decided to go for El Mencho's head. Big mistake. In a raid on a Guadalajara apartment building where they believed he was hiding, a shootout ensued and the CJNG boss escaped. Inspired by the close victory, the Mexican federal police were also invited to the party and a few months later, they too staged their own raid where they killed six CJNG members and missed El Mencho by mere minutes. El Mencho was furious. Not long after, he officially declared war on both the military and the police and from there, the tables turned. On the 19th of March 2015, the federal police were on a completely different mission in a Jalisco town called Ocotlan. This mission had nothing at all to do with the CJNG, and yet the CJNG ambushed them, killing five officers. Two weeks later, in Guadalajara, the cartel stretched their ambition and carried out an assassination attempt on Jalisco's commissioner of public security, Alejandro Solorio, spraying his armored truck with more than 200 bullets. Then, one week after Easter, CJNG sicarios with machine guns and grenade launchers attacked a returning convoy of federal police who were returning from a mission, 15 officers were killed in what is still regarded as the deadliest day for Mexican law enforcement in about a decade. Meanwhile, CJNG lost no men. A few weeks later, it was the Mexican army's turn. They launched an operation to take down El Mencho once and for all, but as they got down from their two EC-725 Super Cougar helicopters, El Mencho's men opened fire with assault rifles and Russian-made RPGs. One of the helicopter's rotors was hit, sending it crashing down in flames. Eight soldiers died that day, and the only survivor was burnt beyond recognition. CJNG had practically declared war on a sovereign state. The last drug lord to do this was Pablo Escobar, but El Mencho wasn't done. His men quickly followed up with rapid violence that paralyzed the entirety of Jalisco. Buses and trucks were hijacked and burnt. Gas stations were set ablaze. The mayhem was so rapid and extensive that the Mexican government was forced to be reactive. They sent 10,000 foot soldiers to secure the state. Unknown to them, the chaos wasn't random. It was well controlled. El Mencho used it as a decoy for the army while he escaped. By the time the Mexican army came to terms with what was happening, he had gone off their radar. But now, it was personal. And you could safely say the army was ready to go to any lengths to put El Mencho's head on a pike. But just as they were about to pour all their resources into the CJNG boss's capture, they got an offer they simply couldn't refuse. The truce. In 2015, after years of fighting, El Chapo and El Mencho decided to make a truce. They divided up Tijuana amongst themselves, shared up trafficking routes, and even corrupt contacts with the police force. But a few months later, around the same time when the Mexican military were about to rain hell on El Mencho, they got lucky and captured El Chapo. This distracted the military, and El Mencho chose a less confrontational definition of peace. Instead of initiating attacks on the military, he focused on breaking his truce with the now imprisoned El Chapo and returned to cannibalizing Sinaloa's territories. His cartel even got bolder, kidnapping and freeing El Chapo's sons for a $2 million bounty that he didn't know just to make a statement. And the violence grew in Jalisco. But this time, Time, they focused on taking out only drug dealers and defectors. In the years since, El Mencho has experienced success after success. Today, the CJNG is in a serious war for Sinaloa-held territory, including Baja California, Sonora, and even Chapo's home state of Sinaloa itself. The only thing standing between him and what he wants is the current Sinaloa boss, El Mayo, whom El Mencho shares more in common with than he would care to admit. Like El Mayo, he also now controls his cartel from the mountains where it is impossible for the military to catch him. And like Mayo, he too has been rumored to be dead in recent times. 